started with our session here, um, module meet blockchain. I'll be honest with you, it's going to be mostly blockchain, less a module because this. Recording. Sorry. Recording. Uh, yeah, we are we are good on the on the. Oh, all right. We are recording now, so that's great. All right. Uh, thank you to our wonderful sponsors for organizing this event. Uh, I see a lot of people of familiar faces, so hello. Uh, he just turned it on. Yeah. Uh, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nick Kalyani. My current startup is called Renhub, hence the shirts. I'm the co-founder and uh, CTO. I also created another uh, company uh, called Walkstarter, which is uh, uh, my uh, volunteer project. Uh, it's a platform I created for to help schools in the US uh, raise money through walkathons and uh, we are just about to hit two million dollars in funds raised uh, with the platform Whoa. and my goal is to get to two billion dollars so we'll see how that goes I'm also, <laughs> also an advisor for an organization called Code for Fun which uh, teaches kids uh, uh, programming in, the, in mostly Silicon Valley a, a Microsoft MVP and also I was uh, one of the co-founders of .NET Nuke Corporation all right, uh, so uh, just a quick uh, a little bit about my current uh, company. Uh, our newest product is called Interface, and uh, we just released the product uh, a few weeks ago, and in the past two weeks, we've had 25,000 downloads. The product is a blockchain product. It's called Interface, and what it does is it allows anyone uh, to be an expert or talk to an expert on any conceivable uh, topic. So this is the long tail model, where it's not about your usual stuff about graphic design and marketing, etc. But it's more about, uh, you know, I'm doing some gardening, where do I plant these flowers? Or uh, I want a quick consult on how I should, what color I should paint my walls or something like that. So uh, it, it works with uh, cryptocurrency and uh, it's, uh, please download it uh, from the app store. You can uh, get the links at interface.benhub.com. So uh, that brings us to today's uh, session, uh, which is about uh, uh, blockchain. And I like how uh, Dilbert uh, uh, talks about it. I, I put this strip up here for a, a reason. One of the co-founders of my company is Scott Adams, who is the creator of Dilbert. And for today's session, uh, at the end, uh, people who have asked very interesting questions and people who have spotted uh, bugs or helped me fix bugs as I write code uh, get uh, get copies of this Dilbert book signed by Scott himself. Oh. So they're all signed. And uh, so there's eight of them. So ask interesting a, questions. You don't have a copy of Wen Bigley? <laughs> I could get you that also. It, things can be mailed also. We have that. So it's cool. Uh, for today's session, I have gone ahead and posted everything that I have here, uh, whether it's PowerPoint or code. You can get it all at tinyurl.com slash dnnconnect-2018. Uh, my Twitter handle is at techbubble. I'd appreciate if you would follow me and give me a mention with these hashtags. Um, and there's the QR code there. Uh, all right, so with that, let us dive right into a blockchain. When I uh, kind of wrote the session abstract, like most people, uh, uh, I, I had this glorious vision, but then it, you know, it's 60 minutes. So let's see how much uh, we, can, we can get done. So um, I'm presuming that you're here because you know at least something about blockchain, but um, <coughs> what I want to do is not spend too much time on stuff that you're going to find elsewhere. I want to focus on stuff on, the, on code and on, on building uh, smart contracts, and we'll talk about what those are. But uh, just as a high-level thing, uh, a blockchain is uh, essentially a public uh, ledger of, of data, and the reason uh, it is so popular is because that same ledger is replicated on millions of computers, and as a result, uh, it is uh, tamper-proof. Uh, unlike regular bank ledgers, etc., which are subject to fraud, with blockchain, you don't have that. Um, you know, a lot of people right now know about blockchain mainly in terms of cryptocurrencies, etc. But uh, blockchain has many other uses too, and I guarantee you, within the next five years, every one of you will have at least one, maybe two or three applications that you are using. Uh, that are blockchain uh, driven and uh, you just have to look under the surface beyond the hype and look at things like Hyperledger etc and see how much work is going on there. Uh, you know things like machine learning, AI etc, they are becoming commoditized and, and the thing is that blockchain is fundamentally transforming uh, industries in a, in a big way. So I think it's going to be pretty big and uh, I'm betting quite a bit on it. 
All right, so specifically, I want to talk today about Ethereum. So the two most public uh, and popular blockchains out there are, of course, the Bitcoin one. The Bitcoin blockchain is primarily about uh, the Bitcoin cryptocurrency. The Ethereum public blockchain is different because it supports applications. It's a, uh, it has something called the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine. It has the ability to run programs on it. Uh, these programs are called dApps or decentralized apps. Uh, they are also called smart contracts. Uh, what makes them interesting is that uh, blockchain being immutable, when you create a smart contract and you put it on a blockchain, it's there forever. You cannot go back and change code. So you have to get it right the first time. So that's a pretty high bar, right? Uh, imagine how many times we, we fix code. Well, not so with smart contracts. When you publish a smart contract out there and people start using it, that's it. You're done. You have whatever bugs there are, you live with them. You know, so you have to. The, the bar is pretty high. So what I'd like to do today is is in order to introduce you to the concept of smart contracts, I'd like to build a small product called Build Starter. I just made up this. Uh, it's kind of like Kickstarter, but for open source teams. So what happens is that the community uh, basically suggests features. We have that. You know, we have ideas, modules, and things like that. This is slightly different in that what the community does is propose a feature by uh, uh, you, uh, submitting a small registration fee. And uh, each feature has a funding goal. So maybe you say that this feature is going to require uh, $2,000 of programming time. And it also has a deadline. And uh, we want to get this funded within 60 days or something like that. At that point, you put it out there, and anyone who's interested can use the smart contract to, to fund it with their uh, Ether. Ether is the currency, the cryptocurrency on the Ethereum uh, blockchain. So you, you can put in a penny, you can put in $100, you can put in $10,000. It doesn't matter what. And what happens is the smart contract uh, waits until the deadline passes, and then one of two things happen. Either the funding goal has been met, in which case the funds are transferred to the person who made the suggestion and proposed, and they can start building it, or the, the funding deadline uh, uh, goal is not met, in which case everyone gets their money back. So imagine doing that with credit cards and uh, what a headache that would be. But with a smart contract, it's all there, it's built in. It's, it's very simple and easy to do. So that's kind of what we are going to uh, focus on. Um, the workflow when you're building a DAP uh, is there's primarily three steps, and you can kind of look at them as dev, stage, and prod, kind of like you would with most development projects. So what you do is you first develop and test with a local blockchain running on your computer. And then in the case of Ethereum, there's a few test public networks out there. Uh, so unlike staging on your servers, it's not like that. You have to actually put your code out there on public blockchains. And the one that I recommend you use is the Robston one because it's more stable and more, adapt, uh, mo more widely adopted. And then finally, when you're done with testing on that blockchain, which is a simulation environment because uh, it's not got real, it doesn't have real ether on it. Uh, then you finally go on mainnet. And mainnet is the public one where you have real crypto, real ether, real money, etc. So those are the three steps. So we, uh, because of the time constraint here, we're gonna focus on the green block here, which is we're gonna do everything locally. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, if, if people want, I can do a video or something like that about how to go to the next step with Robston, etc. Because that's a little more involved and it takes a little more than 60 minutes to get done. All right, now, um, I just want to forewarn you that this stuff is going to go from easy to super complicated. We're going to drop off a cliff very quickly. I'm going to introduce you to, in the following slides now, a whole bunch of new terms, all right? So here we go. We'll start with Truffle. Truffle is the framework of choice for developing a Solidity, uh, sorry, uh, Ethereum uh, smart contracts. It's a, a JavaScript-based framework, and what it does is it makes it super easy. If you know JavaScript, Truffle makes it super easy to develop uh, smart contracts. The language that you use is called Solidity. Uh, Solidity is like JavaScript, but not JavaScript. It's just different enough where anytime you think you've got it right, you will be wrong. So that's kind of how it works. Uh, it it ha has a lot of different keywords and a diff bunch of different rules, etc. So it's, it's different in that regard. And then you have Mocha, which is the testing framework, which is commonly used by other in JavaScript projects. 
And then there's chai, which is the assertion framework. So anytime you have a testing framework, you have, you know, you need to assert equals and not equals and all that kind of stuff. So you have chai for that. So that's your package where you do some of the, the development, but then your local blockchain simulation comes with, and we're talking desserts here, so with truffle, there's ganache. So ganache is your local uh, blockchain, and uh, we're gonna see how that works in, in just a second. So as I said, right away here, we have like, uh, how many, six terms, five terms, you know, and we'll, we'll and here's some more. So next is, um, once, you know, what, what, I, what I just showed you was everything to build a smart contract. But uh, a DAP, a decentralized app, is not just what's on the blockchain, it's also the client piece of it. The client piece might be a mobile app, it might be a web app, it might be a DLN module, etc. For today, what I'm going to do is show you a very generic HTML, CSS, JS kind of client that you can plug it into any DNN module or really any website, you know. That's, uh, so I use the minimal amount of frameworks there. I use basically Bootstrap and jQuery. I wanted to do React, et cetera, but then I'm like, okay, I'm going to alienate the people, alienate the people who hate uh, React. I think most, of, most people have become tolerant of jQuery, so I think we can go, go with that. Um, so MetaMask is a, a browser extension that uh, is supported on Chrome, Firefox, uh, on all platforms, and it is essentially a wallet. And what your app does is it helps, uh, it communicates with MetaMask to unlock your wallet so your app can do certain things uh, with it. Uh, working with MetaMask is a framework called Web3, uh, Web3.js specifically in this case. Web3 exists in different flavors. In this case, it's Web3.js. Uh, Web3 provides all the functionality for your, your client-side app to interact with the blockchain, and we'll see how that works uh, also. And this client-side uh, piece also works with, with uh, Ganache. All right, so that's all the slides I think I can tolerate, so we will go right into uh, coding. Uh, all right, so what I'm gonna do here is bring up my, uh, my Visual Studio Code editor. All right, so uh, in order to, yeah, I, I, will, I will be zooming in. Uh, I, I prefer, I'm gonna zoom in on the, the, the actual content uh, versus this, so I'll do that here, okay. So um, when you install Truffle, it is a command line tool, and out of the box, you can tell it to create a new project. And what it does is it creates a bunch of folders for you and a bunch of default kind of things. While this looks like a lot of stuff, you can ignore 90% of it because it's boilerplate stuff. It's there on every project. And uh, the, the part I want you to focus on is the files that are ending in SOL. Uh, they don't mean what you think they mean. Uh, uh, what they mean is solidity uh, so source code. So that's uh, super uh, dull, right? See, maybe I should try the lighter. Um, would it be better if I use the lighter theme, you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'd have to change it. I haven't changed it in a while. Uh, maybe put off the lights? Uh, yeah, I tried that. Does anyone not change this? What if I just comment out the theme? Will it go to default? I think this is the default. Oh, that is a default? Uh, how do you get a light? Oh, there? Mm -mm. It's uh, when you go uh, in the corner, uh, there's an uh, option color scene. Uh, uh, in the bottom? No, uh, if you... Bottom left, bottom right? Uh, bottom left. Bottom left? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there, there, there you go, okay. Uh, color theme, so. Color theme, got it. Lifesaver. Let's go with uh, Light Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Yeah. Much better. Much better, all right. Thank you, <coughs> Lifesaver. All right. Um, all right, so... Um, before I go into showing you how the Solidity code file works, let's go look at uh, some of the underpinnings of it, which is the blockchain stuff. So I'm going to first go to Ganache. Now, Ganache is a desktop app. It'll run on Windows, it'll run on Mac, etc. And what it does is it simulates the public blockchain for you. 
uh, one of the things about the blockchain is it's, a, it's, it's essentially the world's crappiest database, the world's slowest, crappiest database, but it has its, its merits, and which is why it's important. But when you're developing, you can't wait every time you've changed code for like, you know, 15 minutes before you see if it worked or not. That, that's like, that was in the 60s or whatever when you had punch cards. You can't do that. So what Ganache does is if you see this little icon here, it's, it's looping, it's auto mining. So it takes the mining part of the blockchain, which is essentially solving cryptographic problems and uh, creating blocks, uh, it makes it automatic and it makes it fast. It does it every like half a second or so, all right? So what, what you have here is a list of addresses on the Ethereum blockchain. Now on the Ethereum blockchain, if you, uh, there are two kinds of uh, accounts as they call them. They're also called addresses. There are accounts that have a private key. So they are intended for users. They're intended for your wallet to, sh to store cryptocurrencies, et cetera. And then there are accounts that have no private key and those are smart contracts. So we're gonna deal with both of those today but just remember that if you have a smart contract deployed on the blockchain, you don't have a private key for it. It's there and uh, only the rules that are defined in the code allow you to act upon that smart contract or modify it, et cetera. You can't do anything else. With a personal account, one that you have a private key, you control that I want to do this with my money. I want to move it from here to here, et cetera, and so on. One thing you'll note here, Ethereum addresses, unlike Bitcoin addresses, always begin with a 0x. So when you see a 0x, you know it's an Ethereum address right away. Now, look here at this uh, a line here that says mnemonic. It's got a few random words there. Those are actually not random. They, are, uh, they conform to a standard called BIP, BIP39. So BIP39 is a, a mechanism, uh, a mathematical me uh, format by which this mnemonic is enough for you to generate an infinite number of addresses, their public keys, and their private key keys. So if you buy a hardware wallet, for example, you, it will come with a, a, a mnemonic. If you lose that mnemonic, then people have access to everything, every address that can be generated that you've used with that mnemonic. So what's happening here is that with this particular mnemonic, it's generated these addresses and that's what we're going to use for testing. I want to go to my browser here and show you um, this website. Uh, let's see here. Let's just Google bit39. Um, in, in the GitHub link, I have, put, uh, in the Git, uh, I have put the links to all of this, but this is a mnemonic code uh, uh, converter. And here you can go and you can generate. So I'm going to say generate for Ethereum. And uh, I'll say generate. And if you go down here, you'll see that it's generated all these addresses. Now they all look the same, except each of them has a, an index, zero, one, two, etc. So one of the things you wanna do when you're transacting with cryptocurrency is never use the same address twice for a transaction. Because once you do that, you become no longer anonymous. You, you, it's easy to figure out who you are because you can see the flow of of uh, addresses and the flow of transactions. So with a mnemonic, you have the ability to have an infinite number of addresses. And in fact, every decent uh, crypto exchange and every decent crypto wallet will always give you the option to generate new address. So if I'm gonna uh, you know, send a, a crypto request to Joe, I'll send him one address and to Clint, I'll send another one, et cetera. So there's no way to correlate the two. And uh, with this tool, you can generate as many as you want. So I can say 50. So that one mnemonic just allows you to generate as many because it's essentially a mathematical formula. So that's an important point to, to, to understand. All right. So as you can see here, Ganache is basically uh, waiting for stuff to happen. When I do anything, when I make a call to it, you will see, we'll come back here and we'll see that there are blocks being generated because it's essentially simulating a blockchain. We'll see every transaction and we'll see every log that happens. So right now, there's nothing, it's pretty boring. So we'll co come back to that. All right, let's go into our editor again. And uh, right now, uh, we have the code files. I'm gonna go ahead and view the integrated terminal in here. So I can show you that, I, I told you that Truffle is essentially a command line tool. So if I type Truffle correctly without making a typo, um, 
it'll show me all the different commands that, that, that it supports. So you can compile code, you can deploy, you can test, etc. We're going to do two things with Truffle today. We're going to test, run test scripts, and then we're going to compile uh, our uh, uh, Solidity code. So uh, there's not a whole lot to show about Truffle because it's a framework, it works behind the scenes. Let's go ahead and dive into uh, our uh, Solidity source file here and uh, kind of uh, start putting it together. So uh, I didn't want to waste a whole lot of time having you see me copy uh, type things, so I'm going to do a lot of copy paste for you, but I'm going to talk through it. So the Solidity source file is, as you can already see, you know, it's got the C uh, language. Oh, what happened there? Oh. Oh, that went off. Did you sign a smart contract with Beamer? Sorry? Did you sign a smart contract with Beamer? Yeah, I did not. At the end of the session, you will <laughs> So until it restores itself, um, a question uh, about the, the app that you're making in yes. your company. Um, I mean, basically, if you just wanted to have, like, let's say, accounts and say this person has so many dollars on it, this person has so many dollars on it, I mean, you wouldn't need a blockchain for that, right? So what's the added value of the added complexity? Yeah. So uh, the, the advantages of the blockchain there, it's a very good question, are, are multifold. First of all, there's this cross-border transaction, so we don't have to worry about things like taxation, etc. Uh, when you have micropayments with credit cards, uh, especially if they are really small, the, as a percentage, the fees are, get, can get pretty high. So uh, it can get as high as 20, 25 percent. But the biggest reason is about openness. Uh, every credit card processor is tied to a bank which has rules about what businesses can and cannot use their credit card uh, processing for. With the blockchain, there is no censorship. You can use it for any business purpose you, you choose. So that's an important consideration also. Also, when it comes to things like escrow, which we do, for example, uh, one of the things we're going to introduce is the ability to have scheduled time slots. So you can just say, I'm free on next Thursday from 10 to 5, and on next Tuesday from 2 to 3. And people who are interested in talking to you then can go ahead and book your time then. But uh, what, what, when that happens on the blockchain, we escrow tokens from both parties. So we escrow it from you to keep you honest that you actually show up for the appointment and we escrow it from the person who's making the appointment because they're going to pay you eventually. So after the transaction occurs, then the escrow thing is real. So doing all of that with credit card, uh, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly uh, with holds yeah, and things I mean, like that. I mean, you could just have a, a, an account. A, a running balance. Yeah, but a lot of people don't like to keep a bunch of money sitting around in, in someone else's, you know, uh, it's not under their control anymore. Like. Uh, you, you might, but most people are, are not comfortable with having hundreds of dollars just sitting around in an app somewhere which they may or may not use. So those, those are some of the concerns. But censorship is, is, uh, is a big one. Do you have this one? You want me to run outside and find help? Did you switch it to BGA there? I just have power button. Maybe there's another button to switch into. It says no input. Should I disconnect and reconnect? No. Well, it's, it is connected, so it yeah, detects it. There you go. Just have to call in the smart people. Um. I think you just need to put all the world's engineering talent on fixing presentation projector <laughs> problems. <It's> <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> this is a problem that we should have solved by now. You know, we can put people on the moon, we can put, uh, you know, rovers on Mars, but we can't fix this thing. All right, here we go. So, uh, as you can see, uh, it's JavaScript slash C oriented. Uh, this is a compiler directive that tells it which version of Solidity compiler to use, because I said earlier, right, it's immutable. You put it out there, uh, it doesn't change. So you want to make sure that the compiler is using the exact version that you intended for and nothing different, not even a, a, a minor version uh, different. Um, just like a class, we have our, our contract uh, name here. And here's an interesting line. So using safe math for UINT256. 
So this says that for unsigned integers, use a library called SafeMath. There is a company called Open Zeppelin that makes awesome uh, smart contract plugins, uh, even smart contract templates, etc. Uh, they are very thoroughly tested and very secure. One of the challenges with writing smart contracts is they deal with money. So you have to be extremely certain that everything you're doing is right. With SafeMath, the reason it exists is because, uh, and uh, by the way, it has basic operations, multiply, divide, subtract, and add. The reason is because with uh, smart contracts, and especially with cryptocurrencies, you're dealing with numbers that, are, that have 18 digits long. Like the, the fundamental unit of uh, Ether is called a way, and that's 18 digits long. So when you have that kind of precision involved, uh, JavaScript cannot handle that normal stuff. Most uh, things can't. And as a result, what happens is you have these wrapping errors where what you intended for it to be like a 10 could become a 10 million or a 10 billion or something like that and be very bad if you're dealing with large sums of money. What SafeMath does is make sure that you don't have those kind of errors. So anytime you do any computation, uh, SafeMath is kind of default. I always plug it in there because uh, I put it in there and then I forget about it. I always use uh, their functions because I know that I'll never have any rounding errors and things like that. So, uh, so that's SafeMath. Now, as I go through here, you will see that there's not a whole lot of code that's going to be here. The reason is that you have to be extremely judicious about what code you put on the blockchain. The blockchain is not a storage database. Storage is expensive on the blockchain. Processing each line of code is also expensive. So you have to make decisions about what's going to be on um, chain and what's going to be off chain. Those are the, the terms we, we use. You only put on the blockchain the data that you absolutely need. Typically, for example, like you wouldn't store pictures or you wouldn't sh store documents. What you would store is a hash of a document or a hash of an image because that's a small thing and uh, a hash uh, is a one-way uh, algorithm, right? When you hash something, it will give you a string and if you make even a tiny change in the original document, the hash will immediately be different and therefore you know that it's no longer the same thing. So use the, the blockchain for storing references to uh, data and not all the data itself. Now, if you, obviously you're going to store some data, but not huge amounts of data. There is, uh, and I don't want to uh, go into that uh, today, but you can look up IPFS for the interplanetary fi file system. So that is a secure distributed uh, file system that where you can put uh, large documents and things like that. Uh, so in addition to not storing a lot of data with code, you have to be super careful because each line of code that you put into your smart contract costs money in, uh, and the unit is called gas. So because this runs on the Ethereum virtual machine, every operation that's there costs money. The more code you write and the more complex it is, the more expensive every transaction is. So we are super careful about writing our very tight code that uh, is highly optimized and Again, uh, one of the benefits of, uh, of having that expense is you don't write a lot of code, which means you don't make a lot of mistakes. Because remember, it's immutable once you put it out there, right? All right, so let's start with uh, getting some, uh, some, some data variables on here, uh, which is uh, a common thing you would do in just about any, any application. So I'll copy uh, those down here. And uh, now let's look at some of these data types. So Boolean, that's pretty normal. Uh, unlike JavaScript, we have scope here. So this is a private um, variable. Now, this is a misnomer. <coughs> uh, on the day, on the blockchain, 100% of everything is public. So what does private mean? It just means private in the scope of things, right? Just remember, anything you put on the blockchain is public. It's there replicated on millions of computers. So whether, there is no way for you to hide anything on the blockchain. That's, it's, by design, it is public. This just means the scoping of it. So I've got a few variables here uh, that are Boolean. And then I have one called address. So address is a special type that refers to an account. I told you there are two kinds of accounts, right? There's the account with the private key, which is for uh, you know wallets and things like that. And there's the account uh, without private key, which is for uh, smart, smart contracts. All right. Um, so this is an unsigned integer. Uh, 
So I'll explain what uh, I'm doing with some of these variables here in, in a moment. Uh, but uh, let me just go through the types first. So this is our data structure. So essentially, it's like an object. And uh, so I have a data structure here called feature, which represents a feature that someone wants to create. And it has, you know, whether it's been registered, who's the creator, what the goal is, when will the funding uh, end, what is the current level of funding, has it been paid out, who are all the people who have uh, put in money, and what are the amounts, and there's an array. So mapping, uh, there's, I've used it two places here. Mapping is one of the most interesting data types that you have in Solidity. It, think of it as a dictionary, right? We use dictionaries all the time. Uh, uh, we basically give it a key as a value. Uh, most of the time in .NET or JavaScript or anything like that, you use a test. You say, you know, your variable name brackets key uh, if, if, if null, right? You test that to see if it exists or not. One of the challenges you will have with uh, Solidity and blockchain code is that no matter what key you provide, it exists. Every possible key that you can imagine always exists. So you cannot test to see if null. It's, it's never going to be true. So this is why you are required whenever you have any kind of data using th that is part of the, the mapping to have a variable which you flag when you create data. In my case, I have created a Boolean here called registered, which as soon as I put something in my mapping, I set it to true. And that way I know that that mapping actually I have created and exists because otherwise it would be impossible for me to tell uh, if that mapping existed or not. Now I'm talking the abstract right now, but it become a little clearer as we add some more code. Uh, let's see, what are these uh, variables here? So this registration fee refers to if you want to post a new feature, you know, uh, you have to pay for it. And right now I have put approximately $100. So this is the representation of $100 in today's uh, exchange rate, which is what, like $500 or something for Ether. Uh, but it's converted to, to weight. So that's 10 raised to uh, minus 18. So that's uh, what that represents. Uh, all right, so we've got our variables down. Uh, what we can do now is, is save. And uh, I have some tests already written. Let me show you those tests. Um, I'll go into my test framework here. Um, at this point, this is where Truffle is doing its work. It has allowed me to have the Solidity code, but everything else I'm doing is just JavaScript. So here's my uh, tests. So I've written a bunch of uh, tests using standard uh, arrange act assert uh, patterns, right? So let's, uh, let's do Truffle test minus minus reset. The minus minus reset is not necessary. I, I put it always, uh, it forces Truffle to always reevaluate and recompile everything. I found that uh, it has caused me more headaches to not do that where it's cached something and I'm like trying to debug it and it doesn't work. So I'm gonna guess that 100% of my tests are gonna fail. We'll see because I haven't put any of the code, right? So there it's, it's compiling contracts. And now it's going to try and run uh, my tests. And we'll go and look at some of these tests in a bit. But yeah, it's, already, it's zero fit passing because I don't have enough code yet. But what we'll do is we'll keep adding code until we get well, you know, those tests to, to pass. So let's go back here. And after our variables, the next thing we want to do is add our constructor. So let's do that. So here is my constructor. So uh, when I put this constructor, it's going to give me a compiler flag because they made a recent change where uh, uh, for the constructor, you're supposed to actually use the word constructor. But um, I'm using a different version of Solidity than the compiler because there's some other bugs with it that I want, don't want to deal with in this session. So we'll just ignore the compiler error. So uh, on this constructor, I have here, you can see a scope. So just like variables, even functions have scope. Uh, and you know, that's true in, in many strongly typed languages, but not true in JavaScript. But we're looking at JavaScript-like code here, but we've got this scoping. So, so public means that it's, it's, it's a constructor. It has to be accessible. So here I'm setting the value of a variable called contract owner. 
So up here, you can see that the contract owner is an address variable, and I'm, send, I'm setting it to message.sender. Message.sender is holy. It's most important thing you're gonna have or use in Solidity code. What it means is it, the caller of the program, whoever is calling the, that contract function, that's what message.sender represents. It could be another contract, because contracts are allowed to call contracts. It could be a down-level contract, because a contract is allowed to co call a contract, which is allowed to call a contract, and, and so on and so forth. But message.sender resolves correctly to the original um, a caller. This is also important because when you're, uh, one of the benefits of smart contracts is they're decentralized. You don't need an admin to do a task for you. You just do the task, and the smart contract should have the logic in there that tells if you are allowed to do the task or not. And therefore, anybody should be able to call your smart contract, and it should automatically fail if you're not supposed to do, do that. So message.sender is, is kind of important in that regard. So that's the constructor. And uh, next thing, next topic we talk about is function modifiers. Now, this is not something that I've seen in uh, C Sharp or JavaScript. What uh, function modifiers do is allow you to collapse a bunch of code into reusable little subroutines. So uh, let's uh, paste these here and we'll look at those. So here is a modifier called require is operational. So uh, what I want to do is in my smart contract is have a flag that basically says, you know, there's a problem right now. I want to turn this smart contract off for while I'm trying to figure out. Maybe I, there's a bug in the code and like money is just going away or something. So I have a flag where every function uh, checks to see this flag and sees if it's true or false. If it's false, it says, OK, wait, we can't proceed anymore. So this modifier, uh, what it does is it essentially calls this line of code. and this underscore here represents all the other code that's already there in the function. So you can add require is operational to any function, and this code will then be called by that function. So instead of typing in uh, require operational in every, you know, it's only one line of code, but sometimes you'll have more than that. You can replace it with just that one phrase, require is operational. Uh, require. This is an interesting con con construct you will use it a lot. One of the things you want to do when you write smart contracts is fail as quickly as possible if you're not if the user is not supposed to proceed. Why? Because it costs money to run code, right? So with require, what it does is it checks the condition that you provided. It's a boolean. If it fails, the gas money that the user has paid up to that point is returned and canceled. So this is why you will see smart contract code at the beginning of every function, there will be stacks of requires. It's like require this condition, require this condition, require this condition. That's different from what we do, right? In C Sharp or JavaScript, we go later and we do if something later on, and then if something later on. No, you gotta flip that model around and do all your testing for every possible condition right at the top and require it so that if it fails, you can just blow out of there and, and be done. Um, require contract owner. So this one says that require the message sender to be that variable we initialized in the constructor. So that way, that particular function is only callable by the person who created the contract. Right? So uh, that's, that's modifiers. And uh, w they'll make a little more sense once we actually put them in, into use. All right, the next thing we have is event definitions. 100% uh, of everything you do on the blockchain is asynchronous. You have no idea when you are working with your client app when there will be a result coming back. Uh, you know, for users, a, f you know, a couple seconds of wait time is a long time. So imagine having to wait for 30 seconds or five minutes or 15 minutes for a response. It's just not possible, right? So. Instead, what you do is you define events. The events, when they are triggered by the blockchain with the transaction, are written to a log file. And you can create filters that watch the log file. And based on something appearing, an event appearing in the log file, you then follow up and say, OK, your transaction was successful, or it failed, or something like that. So let's look at the types of events I've created here. 
So I've created, for this case, I've created uh, three events. I've created an event for when uh, uh, registration, uh, re when a feature is registered. Remember, we have, with Build Starter, you're submitting a feature. You're registering a feature that you're, you're proposing. So maybe you're proposing a new language pack or, or, or whatever the code might be. Um, and so when the event is fired, it'll tell you what is the ID of the feature because uh, we don't want to actually store the feature on here. We want to store a pointer to the feature. So somewhere in some database, you're going to have all the details about the feature. Here on the blockchain, you just have the ID. You know, So it might be, uh, I've chosen a numeric uh, ID, but it could be an alphanumeric thing or something like that. Uh, who created it? And what was the fee? Uh, what, what is the goal? How much are they trying to raise? And when will it end? So this is the information you'll get in, in your event. So now you can... Uh, send an asynchronous toast or a, a notification on mobile or something like that and let the user know that, that that blockchain transaction you submitted three minutes ago, here's the result of it. That's that's how it works. So uh, in uh, we have this kind of anal analogous stuff in banking transactions, etc., where things might span hours or days even, you know, where you want to send a notification back. But on the blockchain, it's the norm. Never, ever expect anything back instantly. In fact, when you stick your transaction out there, you don't even know if it's going to get processed. You may have to reprocess it, right? So a couple of other events here, transfer and, and funding. So this is a good time to pause and see if uh, we've made any progress here and uh, uh, run our tests again. What do you think? Any, anything will pass? Probably not. Probably not, because I haven't added any functions yet. <laughs> so I've just added all the scaffolding. You know, so far we're just working with all the stuff except for the main stuff. So now let's get to the main stuff. Uh, Make the, the ID you put in. Sorry? The, the ID of the contract or, or of the stuff is outside of the blockchain. The ID of the, yeah, when you deploy the smart contract to the blockchain, yes. you will get an address. And that is the deployed address for. But how do I link that to the outside? Contract where all the specifications are. Which contract? Well, you, you have, of course, a, a document or something. Yeah. That's stored in the, in the blockchain. Yeah. But you have to link that document to the blockchain. Yeah, so you either put a, a hash of the document yes. or a pointer to the document in your database or something like that. So an ID, your SQL ID, for example, uh -huh. or a hash. But you didn't do that here, did you? I, I did. Uh, so here, this ID. Oh, this could be a hash. It could be a hash. I chose to make it a, a numeric ID. Uh, yeah, it could have been a hash also. Um, but it always was a hash because you have to be sure that it's, uh, it's not tampered with. Yeah, so, so that's a different use case. In this case, I'm just trying to track the money associated with it. I'm not trying to check the authenticity of the document. But you are absolutely correct that if you're trying to validate and make sure that someone signed this document or had this document in their possession on a certain date, then you would want to store the hash and not a reference because, of course, the outside database is mutable. You can change it, do whatever you want with it. So you are correct about that. Yep. All right, we're throwing some utility functions here, which uh, uh, basically, you know, sets and gets, etc. So uh, I need those, so I'm going to put them there. And then we'll get to the heart of the, the matter, which is the smart contract the functions. All right. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to sit and talk about those a, little, a, a lot. Let's just get into our smart contract function. This is the meat of it. All right. So now we have a method called register. I'm actually going to cut it here because it's easier. All right. So let's I'm look at... a squiggly bracket that looks a little suspicious. Sorry? On 201, there's a closing bracket. Do you need that? Yeah. I, well, we'll find out. So, mm -hmm. and if we do, uh, you've earned yourself uh, a book. <laughs> so, all right. So let's let's find out. Okay, so I, I have I kind of spaced everything out quite a bit so you easily see what the parameters are and everything. So um, all right, so we've got three parameters here. Uh, they are typed: the ID, the goal, and the end timestamp. This is external, meaning. This function cannot be called from inside the smart contract. It must be called from outside. Uh, uh, Ethereum virtual machine does a whole bunch of optimizations based on whether a function is supposed to be called from inside the smart contract or from outside and so on and so forth. 
payable. This is super important. Payable means that this contract, this <coughs> method is capable of receiving money. So you can submit ether when you call this particular method and that ether is handled in code. Uh, that ether is represented by this thing, message.value. So previously I told you about message dot what? Sender. Sender, right? So that's important. Equally important is message.value. Message.value represents the amount of ether that someone has submitted when they call this particular function. So I was telling you about stacking requires. Here we go. So require that the ID is greater than zero. Require that this ID is not already previously registered. We don't want to have duplication. Require that the goal is greater than zero. We don't want a zero goal. Require that the amount of uh, ether they're submitting is greater than or equal to the registration fee you have set. The registration fee is, is a, a variable. You can set it with set registration fee. So I put $100 by default. You remember earlier up here, we had that value, that long value. It's 100, but you could make it $5 on, you know, for someone to submit an idea. Or you could make it $1, it doesn't matter, or one penny. It doesn't matter what. But, um, but that's, when you're registering a feature, it has to come with a payment. So that's what this is about. Now, uh, uh, one of the big challenges with time, when you're trying to do a demo like this, is, you know, imagine saying that the, this is gonna last for one week. Obviously, we can't sit here for one week. So I have created a, a, a variable called testing mode, which basically says ignore all times right now, because we just wanna get through this without uh, uh, waiting. Uh, otherwise, we would require that uh, the end timestamp they are providing be in the future. You can't register and say, hey, I'm submitting this feature for everyone to vote on and pay for when it's already expired, right? You want to give people enough time to vote on it. All right, so the first thing we do is uh, the moment this function acts, we're going to transfer the fee that has been provided to the wallet of the contract owner. Where is the contract owner set in the, anybody? In the constructor, remember? <laughs> Message dot sender in the constructor, we, the first, the only thing we did in the constructor is set the contract owner, right? So whoever is deploying the contract is the contract owner. So they are omnipotent in that regard because we are saying that, so they get all the money. So as soon as someone registers, the ether, the contract immediately takes that ether and moves it over to that person's wallet. Uh, so that's what that code is doing right there. Um, why are you putting it in another variable? I'm assuming this is message sender down here as well? No, because this function is being called by you. I am the person who deployed the contract. So message.sender is you. So I don't want to send the money you're sending to the contract back to you, uh -huh. right? So that's why. Okay, and then I add to my address, uh, my, my mapping. I add uh, features is my mapping. If you remember earlier here, we, we have right here. This mapping says the key is of type I, uint and it is value is of type feature, right? So it's a dictionary of feature objects. So here we are going ahead and populating that and we are setting the default values for everything. So we are saying it's registered true. The only reason for this to exist is because of that quirk I told you about, where on the blockchain, in, in Ethereum, all keys always exist. All right, uh, I guess uh, we have only 10 minutes. Better hurry up. <laughs> uh, well, if you guys don't mind, because we had some of those interruptions, it, since it's lunch, can I go over a little bit? Sure, yes. yeah, Thank you. Sure, yeah. um, all right, so, so we set that, and then we immediately emit uh, two uh, events. One is that someone has registered something, and the other is that funds have been transferred from person X, from wallet X, to wallet Y, and how many funds were, were, were transferred. So that happened right here. So that's it. Very simple code. It just registered a feature, and it moved a little bit of money, right? So. Now, uh, we might be able to actually get uh, one thing to pass here, I'm thinking. Function variable struct uh, expected. All right, so this is where that uh, 
that curly brace was, right? <laughs> All right. Good luck debugging this, Nick. All right. Uh, no, 201. It's, it's, it's pretty, yeah, it's just on 234 or something. Put close yeah, just put one there, right? Let's see. By the way, you have everything in one file. Is this necessary? Or like uh, other systems, you would have more? You can, you can split it up. <laughs> Um, but then you have to write deployment scripts and all that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. So uh, we are we we are we are making pro. Ooh, one passing. All right. So which one passed? Let's see. Can settle a feature using settle. Oh, that's not the one I expected to pass. No. Can, can register a feature using feature and fetch it uh, event submitted. So oh you know what the colors in this one are backwards. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, that is good. Uh, red is good. I had uh, green. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Uh, yeah, so, so we had two events emitting, and uh, uh, let's go and look at my test. So my test says, uh, create an account, set the goal, set the fee, call the register method, and then immediately after that, call the get feature method. Now notice here that this method I'm calling uh, and I'm sorry, I can't go into too much explanation about this. You'll have to look at the code and figure it out. <laughs> this one I'm calling without dot call at the end. And this one, which is get feature, a method that is also in there, I'm calling with call. When you're writing Mocha tests, uh, if you are calling a read-only function, you use call. If you are calling a function that is changing state, you don't use call. That's the difference here. Get feature is just doing a get, and so there's no, uh, it's, it's read only. So you can do that. So um, let's go ahead and uh, plug in some more stuff here. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just plug everything in, and we'll let the whole thing pass because I want to show you um, what's happening on the blockchain because that's the funnest part of all. Uh, So um, you have access to the source code. You can see it. But I just want to talk through one more function, and then we'll, <coughs> we'll go to the blockchain. So uh, settle. So settle here is essentially, again, remember, anyone can call this. This is not a special function that only you know, the contract owner can call. Uh, the, the function here is saying settle the feature call ID. In, in, in business terms, settle means that the the period for people to fund that feature is over, and it's now time to transfer funds or fail it. So in this case, we are saying, uh, we're doing, this is the, the big check here. If the funding is exceeds the goal, then and only then is anything gonna happen. Otherwise, it's just gonna blow up and say, nope, sorry, cannot settle because the funding is not exceeded or met the goal. All right, but if it does meet that condition, then we're going to set a variable called payout with the funding. We're going to set the funding to zero. We're going to transfer all the money that has been funded, and it could be well over the goal, to the person who submitted that feature. So if if you know if Joe submitted that feature, here's a great idea for how to change authentication. He gets all the funding because everyone who's sent that funding trusts him to actually build it. Obviously, the smart contract doesn't have any guarantees about what's going to happen in the real world. Joe will take that money and run away, and that's possible, but the smart contract doesn't care about that. Uh, and then you will emit a transfer uh, method, so everyone knows that's done. We're going to go a little, all right. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, so uh, one important thing you have to uh, remember when you're writing smart contract functions is uh, you have to be very careful about the order of code because my, miners can essentially do what are called replay attacks where if you have, if you uh, transfer something and then zero it out, what they can do is run that method like 100,000 times and transfer, 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 transfer again and again in the milliseconds before the next line of code could be executed. So you could essentially empty out a wallet. So always use the pattern of zeroing out first, so subtract first, then send the money to whatever. 
That way you cannot be subject to that attack. It's a very common attack and a lot of uh, smart contracts fall victim to that where the moment someone sees that you're not zeroing out first, boom, it's, it's a candidate for attack immediately. Um, all right, so now, now let's run these tests and bring up Ganache here. So I'm gonna go ahead and do something here called restart Ganache. So I think this means that there is not something like a conception of a transaction here? It is a transaction, but what's happening is in the state machine, if you, it, you're the miner, you have full control over the, the computer, you can make it do things that, uh, so, so imagine if you are sitting on a server and you have control and the ability to change SQL Server code. What, what kind of damage could you do to a database if you had that ability? You could bypass security and all those kind of things. That's what a miner has. And that's why you want to make sure your code is, is secure. Well, I mean, in the sense of the fraction that uh, it either runs all together individually or it doesn't work. You're saying that it can be broken. Yeah, that's, so that's what revert is for. So <coughs> state, state changes, uh, if you don't revert them, will persist. So it's up, it's up to you to make sure that you don't get to that point. The, the language is not very mature. It's still growing. And there's a lot that, of work that needs to be done. It's n not perfect. It's not at that level yet. All right, so let's we'll just watch this blockchain here while I run my test. I'm going to pop it back as soon as I hit the up arrow here. So we're going to see my tests running. And we're going to see these values change. So I'm running it using this account. And so this is going down because gas is being depleted from this. It's using up gas to run transactions. And so I have all three passing there. Let's go and look at what happened on the transactions. So we're going to look bottom to top. So first, my contract was created. So it used that much of, of, of gas. That's expression wave. So it's actually a very small amount. It's not a huge amount. Uh, the gas price and the gas limit is set by the network dynamically, and you can go to Ethereum uh, gas station uh, info, I believe, and you can look at the current price, etc. It's dynamic; it changes all the time. Um, then, uh, let's see. Next was a contract call. Uh, all of this is in byte. In, in I'm going to say bytecode, but it's really. Uh, the, the EVM doesn't have your source code anymore. It's been completely changed. So you, don't, you won't see your source code anymore. You'll just see binary data uh, on there. So this was my first test. Uh, let's see. Then this was the second <coughs> test. Uh, in the testing framework, it resets the contract every time. So you have a clean slate to start off with. Uh, here is some value being transferred. So this is Ether actually being transferred from uh, one, one uh, wallet to the next. So there's 0.17 Ether. This is actually the $100, approximately $100 uh, that uh, paid for uh, the registration. So that's, these are all the calls. And here you can see all the different blocks that were mined. And within each block, you would find the, the transaction. You can go into more detail and see the exact... Uh, We've mined quite a bit here, so yeah, there we go. So you can see which transaction happened, what gas usage was there. It's easier to spot it here because it's got a little GUI, uh, etc. So uh, at, at this point, you know, all my tests are, are passing, and uh, the code, if, if you go and look at the code, it's more of the same. It, there's nothing special about this, it's basic logic. I'm moving things uh, around, etc. So now that this this is 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 done, um, we would want to. Uh, we had some problems. So I'm going to go five minutes over. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, now we need to get to. Uh, I want to very quickly get to the uh, the client part of it because this was all the the smart contract part of it. So let me show you that real quick. So um, in order for that to work. So first of all, here's my um, uh, HTML. Let me get this out of the way. Uh, like I said, it's just real basic HTML. There's uh, a table, and it lists all the, the transactions. I'm going to uh, bring it up in a browser real quick here. But before I do that, uh, let me go ahead and uh, 
Let's see, I don't have time to do this bit by bit, so let's go ahead and just uh, do it all at once. I wonder if I can just undo, undo on this and make it faster. Will that work? Probably not, all right. I could revert, but I don't know what states it. So be, bear with me, I will copy paste as fast as I can. So this is, now we are dealing in the world of JavaScript. Now this is our normal world. All the normal problems that we have with JavaScript are going to be there. Uh, the one part I want to talk about while uh, is ABI. So application binary interface. This is the mechanism by which JavaScript code in your web app or your DNN module knows how to interact with the blockchain. Uh, web3 JS uses the ABI, the application binary interface, in order to do its magic. And I'm going to show you how to generate that ABI. That part is kind of important. If you don't do that, then you won't know, you won't be able to do uh, the next part. So uh, I think this is all one thing. Yep, it is. All right. Um, so we'll go ahead and stick that right in here. Okay. So um, here I have configurations. I have configurations for different networks. So my local host is Ganache. So this is port 8545 is Ganache. And the address of the contract uh, I have is one I was doing in testing. So one of the challenges with uh, doing it with Ganache and using a web client is you have to go and look at what was the contract address this time. And it's, it's right there. That's the address right, right now. So you would, want, you would have to do, do that. <coughs> um, now, let's talk about the ABI. So uh, Truffle compiles your uh, entire uh, Solidity file into a JSON uh, specification uh, file that is essentially an API. So how do you get, get to that? You go Truffle compile. Notice here this build folder, it's empty right now. And we do Truffle compile. And it gave us the warning about the constructor, which I expect. But now, here, I have ABI. These are, these are what I call ABI files. So in here is every function that's in there, every parameter it accepts in, and every return value it's going to give. Because the compiled version is in a version, is a very compact format that only the Ethereum virtual machine understands. Your calling code will never be able to interact with, with it at that level, so you need the ABI for that. So, so it's over, a bit like a WSDL for XML. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's that. Okay. It's it's a, an API. Is is it? So the first thing. Uh, so here, uh, what we do is we we fetch that, and once that's there, then we initialize our Web three. We tell it here's the ABI. And the provider I want to use is my local host. So once you do that, you now have a Web3 instance of your contract. So you can now start making calls. So uh, I had a method called get feature in my um, Solidity. So let's see, get feature, there it is. So that just gets what is the current state of a feature, you know, how much has been funded, uh, uh, et cetera. So here, I'm doing my contract, which I initialize here, get feature, and remember, it's a view method, so I call. Uh, calls are free, which is why you have this distinction between uh, you know, a state-changing method, which costs money, and reading, reading infinite amounts of data of the blockchain is free, so you can have, have those kind of methods, right? So um, I'm calling for ID 1000, like give me this feature. Um, so let me actually go ahead and uh, I, I use a, a uh, little node uh, module called SuperStatic uh, to run a web server on here. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, go to localhost 3474. And so that's the little UI I, I made up where um, you can see that when I hit register here, uh, I'll zoom in. It will call. Uh, it's going to call that wrong contract ID. But um, you can see uh, it actually did work. It, it gave me a transaction uh, 
remember I said when you fire off calls to the blockchain, you never get a result back immediately. What you do get is a transaction hash. You can use that later to look in the event log and say, hey, where's this transaction? And look it up. So this one says 0873E3, oh, uh, right? So let's go look on our, our blockchain and we should see that transaction, uh, right? Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There, there it is. It's right there on top. So I did. Uh, uh, it was a register, so I, I called register, and it called the blockchain, and it actually made that transaction happen. So in my code, uh, if you t take a look at it, uh, uh, you will see that there's basically uh, an example of two things. One is, how do you call a read? So this is it right here. And then how do you call a write method? And this is it right here. So with the write method, what you have to do is you have to provide all the parameters it's expecting. And in addition, you have to do one more thing. You have to specify which account it's calling from. So uh, how does it know which account it's calling from? Well, in fact, how does it even know to put Web3 on here? Uh, I didn't show you this part, but uh, let me go there right now. In my HTML here, you will find no reference to Web3 script at all. So how did it automatically appear on the page? Well, that's where MetaMask comes into the picture. When you have MetaMask installed, it will in inject Web3.js into every web page on every tab of your browser. So Web3 is always running if you have MetaMask installed. So that way, uh, what happens is when you, read it, when, you, when you call a Web3 function, it's guaranteed to be there. And if you call a Web3 function for an account that is locked, now see mine's unlocked right now, it went right in there. It will throw up the, the MetaMask dialog and ask you to provide a password. Regardless of which uh, website or which client app you're calling. So because all your private keys, etc., are right here in MetaMask, which is a, a, a wallet. And uh, it is responsible for doing all the legwork of communicating with uh, uh, essentially injecting Web3 so you can then communicate. So I'm sorry I kind of rushed through the end part of, of, of this. I would love to have gone longer, but this is a complex topic and uh, I'm trying to distill in an hour things that take like months to, <laughs> months to figure out. But hopefully this whetted your interest and I'm happy to you know, chat anytime and uh, if you want to go over the source code or whatever, do a Zoom call. I'm happy to help. I, I love this stuff. I think it's very much the future. And um, I think there is a place for it today. And in fact, that's the reason why I, I created this whole open source thing, because I'm actually going to build it and put it out there. I think it, it, open source teams might find it useful and easy to just, instead of trying to figure out which feature we build, why not just let people tell you what feature to build and specify the money. And, you know, here's the money. You know, Go build it. That makes it easier, especially when People don't have to think in terms of, oh, hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. It could be five cents, or you know, and you can get a bunch of people to contribute. You can make things happen. So anyway, that's uh, uh, my my session. And uh, uh, did everyone get the URL? Because all the code is there. You can play with it, you know, and uh, uh, ping me, ping me if there's uh, any problems, etc. So and you can post the URL on the DNN Connect on you know, the sessions. Yes. Yeah. There's a, like for a slide. Oh, there's a. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Great. That's one other thing. Like, yeah, yeah. Does Please. it make sense to have a, a blockchain private? I mean, if you are an incorporate and you want to build something. Absolutely. Hyperledger, etc. Private, private blockchain. Servers that are not talking to the outside world. Yeah. And your own internal blockchain completely apart from everything. Yep. A, a good example is an airline manufacturer where you want to have the provenance of every nut, bolt, screw, washer that went into a plane. Well, you can have your own private blockchain and insist that all your suppliers use that blockchain and tag every part uh, with a code and it goes on the blockchain so you know who supplied it. When there's a defect, you can trace it back to where the aluminum was mined from. Uh -huh. You can do that. What do you mean? You don't have the server that runs the blockchain? Uh, uh, there's software, Hyperledger. IBM Hyperledger. Uh, and there's others also. Yeah. But wouldn't that, like, don't you just need an immutable database? There's no blockchain functionality for that, right? Like, what's the point of having the, the block mining and all that? Like, you just need an immutable database and require. Right. That, that's exactly it. So, that's not we, a blockchain. 
it, it, it is in, in terms of the data structure, uh, but it, it does not have the requirement to have this distributed mining yeah. capability. I mean, you could just have one server, you know, each vendor could have a server that just right. does that. That's not a blockchain, that's just an append-only database. It, no, because the problem is that if you would have just an append-only database, then the airplane manufacturer could still fake the database, right? Because he has full control over that machine. Now, if the supplier wants to be sure that the other guy isn't going to screw him, you really want to guarantee that even the guy running the server can't fake the database. I, I have the answer for you. Uh, the data in a blockchain is not stored linearly. It's stored in a data structure called a Merkle tree. A Merkle tree is essentially a tree structure in which, which the parent is a hash of its two children. If you tamper with any child, the entire tree becomes invalid. So that is not an append-only database because in the append-only database you could remove records from the top and it would still be okay, right? I mean, you could if you could fraudulently do something to remove it, and the data at the end would still be okay. But in the Merkle tree, it wouldn't. It would be invalid immediately. Yeah, and yeah, you can, you can uh, as as the owner of the database, you can still recalculate everything. Yeah, at at that point, yes, yeah. So. But but typically the blockchain is run by the company that is uh, that wants its suppliers. So yeah. it is in its own interest not to mess with its data, right? I mean, the supplier might want to mess with the data, yeah. but not the owner of the blockchain. Uh, that you see? Works. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but, but uh, yeah, ultimately in a closed system, like for example, if you have a consortium of banks, etc., you would have to have an independent third party or someone that's running the blockchain. Otherwise, how do you keep, you know, who, you know, who keeps it honest? But those are all very good questions. The answers are still being worked out. This is all still quite new, you know? So uh, there is no absolutes uh, yet. And uh, it's like, for example, Ripple is the cryptocurrency for the banking system. It's all that, and it's also the network for banking transactions, et cetera, right? So they're trying to be the next, uh, like Swift and all that kind of stuff, the banking uh, system. and. Uh, so there's many different blockchains like that, and they'll keep evolving. Can you put on the slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope this was uh, useful, even though I kind of whipped through it. I'm sorry. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. About these books, I don't know. We'll just. Uh, hey, you said you're betting heavily on blockchain. Why, why is that? Why do you feel so strong about it? He's putting a question in to get a book. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, it's a transformational technology that touches so many different industries. Uh, you know, I, I look at how this very simple construct, this ability to cryptographically secure data in a way that it can't be tampered, it's never been there uh, before. And the fact that it has uh, uses in so many industries, in so many dimensions. So there's the cryptocurrency aspect of it. There's the provenance uh, uh, aspect of it. Um, there is the social aspect of it. For example, there's uh, a, a new startup uh, coming up called uh, True, True Stories, I believe, where uh, they are trying to counter fake news uh, with this, where you know m many people can vouch for a particular article that is authentic and it goes on the blockchain, so it's irrefutable. Like, you can't say that, well, I didn't say that, etc. So yeah. there's all these things that, it's still quite new. Um, our, our, uh, there's a company called Blockstack that is com creating a complete decentralized internet. You've heard that before somewhere, if you watch <laughs> HBO, right? Uh, Silicon uh, Valley, the show, uh, Pipe Piper creates a decent, so that's Blockstack. They are, they are trying to address the problem that Facebook and everyone has your data. With Blockstack, you run a little service on your computer and it has your profile. You unlock and lock data as it goes to different providers. All the data is with you. And you decide who gets access to it when. And it's cryptographically controlled, so they, they, can, they cannot just take your data and do whatever they want with it. So, you, so I guess what I'm hearing is the security and you're putting the power back to the user and they yeah. control their data. Yeah, and then you look at Steam. Steam is uh, where you can have uh, content producers pay, uh, get paid by the masses. So now 
at some point, the music publishers will become irrelevant because people will release their albums on Steam and, you know, get paid directly by users and download stuff. I mean, you remove all these barriers to entry that have existed for a long time and democratize things more while ensuring privacy and security. That's what the blockchain brings. And those are things that we somehow lost since we the internet in the web grew very fast and all those things went away. And like the GDPR is, I think, only the, the start. I think you need things like the blockchain to, to fundamentally change how we interact with data. I think the government will mess it up somehow right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. They can't. They can't. Yeah. Do you agree that um, some people say that blockchain is where internet was 1994, 1995? Yeah. So it's, well, it's not going to take 20 years. No, it's, it, it's way accelerating way faster. I mean, the progress being made every month is, is just it's cra crazy fast. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of CryptoKitties. Have you heard? Mm -hmm. So CryptoKitties is an Ethereum-based game. Uh, it uh, made $11 million in two weeks. Uh, and this is for digital cats, pictures of cats. <laughs> and there's a genetic algorithm in a smart contract. So this is the most popular Ethereum game uh, yet. And um, it, uh, you have to see this to believe it. <laughs> Well, it also crashed the Ethereum blockchain, right? I mean, it did. I mean, that's not so, a good so, thing. So uh, there are cats here that, that cost over $100,000. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't get it. Sorry, I don't get it. So, so you, you pay to have a cat. Yeah, you can, you, can, you can essentially create a cat. You can breed it with another cat. And uh, you, you can, or, or if you're a fe female cat, you can... Uh, <laughs> have babies and you know so this this game is is being played and uh the gen the earlier the generation of the cats the more valuable they are and like i said that was 11 million dollars in the first two weeks since then it's made way more money than that and this is just one uh asset game so there's a, a specification called uh, erc 721 uh which is essentially about digital assets so Think about all the baseball cards and all that out there right now where who knows who's got what, etc. You put it on the blockchain and you know exactly who's got what, when it changes hands and all that kind of stuff. So there is trillions of dollars going to be made in the coming years from the blockchain. And yeah. I'm on that bandwagon because I firmly believe it. So but isn't it incredibly fragile because this crashed the entire blockchain, no transactions could come through anymore. Yeah, so if I have to to pay my hospital bills on the same chain. As you know, this. What? what do you think? What do you think Orwell and Wilbur Wright would say about today's jet airplanes? Right? I mean, if they, you gotta start somewhere. Yeah. Sorry, what? Who would say about what? The, the Wright brothers when they invented the plane, yeah. right? I mean, it, bar it barely took off, right? Yeah. That's where yeah, we are in the infancy of something. It's gonna grow. It's gonna mature. You cannot judge a technology about. Because it crashes at the onset. I mean, well, it's if I'm evolving. an engineer, I can judge it on how it works, and I don't see it working for everything. Like yeah, I, what he's saying I, is, this is yeah. like a, yeah, this is like a testing environment. I mean, yeah. it's growing, it's evolving happen, very fast. People fix problems, yeah. and then it gets better. It's like the first virus. Okay, it, it'll kill you, but <laughs> if it doesn't, you'll fix something, and then. So, in power. response to that problem, okay, right now the the Ethereum blockchain uses something called uh, proof of work. It requires computation power. They are, there's a proposal to change it to proof of stake, which will accelerate and reduce the transaction times significantly. So this is going to evolve, you know? So as an engineer, yes, you can judge it, but you should also be aware that it's changing, it's evolving, yeah. right? So you can't base your opinion on only what is there today. You got to look at what's coming also, what's in beta, what's in alpha, etc. cetera. And the proof of work thing, is that, isn't that going to kill uh, Bitcoin? Uh, so much. Well, they've already forked that on the Bitcoin gold and all, the, all that kind of stuff. See, with, with Bitcoin, because it is the first one, yeah. it's got that first mover advantage. It'll be around for a little longer, yeah. but it'll probably be overtaken by something. But it'll get to 100K first, I think, before. Yeah. No. I, I bet I'm. You're betting on that. Okay. Yeah. And I the, got the application thing that you explained here by Ethereum is just one. 
Ethereum one is of one of the virtual, yeah, it's the most popular one for smart contracts. There's a few others evolving right now, but no one has as much reach and spread as Ethereum. I was in a conference a couple of weeks ago, and it was natural resources. And a guy from South Africa, which has got a diamond mine, puts his hands up and says, how can I use the technology to, um, in, you know, basically, hashtag every diamond is produced. Because what he's worried about is that there's lots of sellers out there that steal the diamond and sell it. And he wants to stop that. And he wants to use blockchain to basically control his ecosystem. But he's got a bigger problem yeah. with De Beers doing the artificial diamonds, etc. Yeah, exactly. And you know the whole marketing thing is falling apart now. And yeah. give it a few years, no one will care about diamonds anymore. Yeah. You know? So he's got bigger problems than tracking his diamonds. <laughs> yeah. No, so you know, I could be one hundred percent wrong. You know, could be betting on the wrong horse, but there aren't that many horses. <laughs> you know, this is the the big horse that's out there right now. I mean, what what else is is there? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, just help yourselves to the shirts and books, guys. Uh, first come, first serve, I guess. You do get one. So, and and Clint gets one because he had that. But other than that.